Um, I am uh, Alex Corwin. I am the center director at Ocali's uh, Lifespan Transition Center. So we uh, we work with um, DODD, uh, OACB. We have a new contract with OOD. We also work with Department of Education and Workforce, previously ODE, um, doing different uh, projects, technical assistance, coaching, training, resource and tool development. Um, so we have a team uh, here um, within the Lifespan Transition Center. I've already seen some familiar names. Uh, we work with some county-based teams that we call MAP teams, multi-agency planning teams that bring together um, OOD, County Board Education, and other folks working with transition age youth in order to help them kind of create better systems and collaboration together. We also um, are part of the Employment First Task Force. Um, and in a previous life, I worked at Department of Education and Workforce. I also worked at the Franklin County Board of Developmental Disabilities uh, as an SSA and SSA supervisor. So. I'm very familiar with your role. Um, I'm excited to kind of share some new strategies or some some new tools with you guys today, and then also answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so again, thank you for for being here today. Uh, I will do my best to monitor the chat um, and everything else. So uh, I think the only thing, yeah, I think uh, I see it in the chat already. If you have yep. questions, feel free to put it in the Q and A, um, and then I'll also um, have some opportunities to engage in the chat here, which is going to start right, <clears throat> excuse me, right now. Um, I see Paul has already started and kicked us off as an SSA from Miami County. So if you don't mind just sharing kind of who you are. Hey, Clarissa. Hey, hey Crawford County. Um, if you don't mind sharing your name, your title, and what county you're from, uh, it would be great just to get kind of a feel of who's here today. Um, if you want to also share, right, like, uh, how long you've been in your role or how long you've been working at the county board. It's always good to know if we have kind of more um, newer SSAs or if we have maybe um, some more veteran folks, um, but already seeing everybody kind of rolling in here from Fairfield County, Lucas County, Cuyahoga County, Delaware, Green, Trumbull. This is wonderful. A lot of familiar names. So good to see some of you. Hopefully I get a chance to see you in person instead of just you looking at me in this webinar. So I apologize for that. Alex, there's a bunch of people that are like at one year, one and a half years. It always just, it, it you know, I'm old and I've been in it forever. <laughs> so. Of course we do have some 21 years. Yay, Sarah. Yeah, but this is great. It's a good, a uh, really good mix. So hopefully even if you've been in your role for 20 plus years, we'll, we'll introduce you to a couple of new tools, um, maybe to help your, your job be a little easier and then uh, we'll end with a, a really fun video um, from Celeste, uh, an NPR host that talks about just having good conversations and how to be really present. So um, thank you guys all for being here today. A quick overview of what we hope to cover. We're going to kind of distinguish between assessment and assessing, uh, right? Is One is kind of this um, the static form, how we're going to document information. Everyone's, I'm sure, very excited about the Ohio ISP and the my assessment within that. Um, but there are opportunities for us to assess and gather that information throughout the year and not just waiting at the end of the ISP meeting. So we'll talk about some strategies for that. We'll identify some tools uh, to get that full team participation, right? It's not really just the SSA's responsibility. We wanna make sure that we're getting all these different perspectives, people that work with the, the person we're serving closely at home, at, at work, uh, in a bunch of different settings. So that way we get a really full picture um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some strategies, again, to have those good conversations and build some rapport and relationships. Um, so that way it's easier to get some of this information um, because inherently our, our system is really invasive, right? We are asking people really personal questions. We're starting with their deficits and their needs. That's a really tough conversation to have, right? So if we, you know, if Lisa and I were to meet for the first time and the first thing we ask ourselves, what do you have a hard time with? Or what do you need help with? Well, how can how can we support you? What are what are some of your needs? How does how does your disability affect how you can um, be independent or work or get to and from different parts in your community? That's a really tough way to start a relationship. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, just being able to navigate some of that together, um, and then we'll we'll take questions on the way. So I think I think we're ready to go. Yeah, you. If you ask me, what how I would say I need help with all things money related, Alex. <laughs> I got no skills there, and guess what? I am now a person that is taking care of my own financial situation. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, if you ever need to give away any money, I'm right here. 
Oh, something. that I don't know about. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to start with a quick definition. Um, so a lot of the conversation or a lot of the topics are going to have like this youth and transition focus. Anything that I talk about today is going to be applicable to adults, right? This is not just a transition conversation. Um, so I just want to kind of preface that. I don't want anyone to just immediately dismiss some of this because transition is on the slide or in some of these definitions, but the Division of Career Development and, and Transition, DCDT's um, definition on assessment is it's an ongoing process, right, of collecting data on the individual's needs, preferences, and interests as they relate to the demands of current and then future working, educational, living, and personal and social environments. Um, so why I like to share this as kind of a starting point is it's not just one meeting and it's not just one tool, right? It is an ongoing process of gathering data and it needs to really be multi-perspective. Uh, and then we need to talk about what are kind of the current demands or what is the current kind of snapshot of this person and some of these preferences, needs and interests. And, and where do they wanna go? Like, what does the future environment look like? Is it is it a new provider? Is it a new living arrangement? Is it a new job? Is it just building new skills? Because that's kind of the goal that they have for this year. So we need to kind of think about these, um, these pins, preferences, interests, needs, and strengths and skills in these two different settings, where we're at now and, and where we're going in the future. So um, this is a, a cycle that we've talked about um, in a couple different tools and resources that we have at Ocali and the Employment First website. So we talk about transition assessment as not just being this one assessment, right? It's not this, I can't just give you like a, a 10 page assessment that's going to be able to really paint this great picture. We have to actually plan for it a little bit and how we're gonna gather all of this information. Um, we're gonna use a variety of perspectives again, maybe a couple different tools. We might need to know um, through situational observations, right? Behavior data, um, reports and self-reflection from the person themselves. What are their goals? What do they see as their strengths? Um, so this planning for transition assessment, but it's really um, a process that can be used for all types and stages of assessment. Uh, but we kind of first start with, we need to gather and review all of the existing information. Right? We need to know a little bit more about what we already know instead of trying to duplicate anything or put folks through additional things that they've already done. Um, so we need to gather and review all of the existing information about the person. And then this process kind of works around clockwise. It, we did this, um, this kind of visual really intentionally. Um, it's not a linear straight line, right? A lot of this gets done at the same time. A lot of it overlaps there in the center, and then it works itself back around. Um, and the reason it does that is because when we talk about all the information we have, and then we talk about the youth or adult with about their life goals, what they want to accomplish this year or in the future, and then we build that pins, right? That profile of what, what do they do well? What do they uh, maybe need some support with? What technology are they using? Who are they already connected with, with the different um, services like Family and Children First, OOD, uh, mental health, behavior support, whatever it could be. And then again, we're discussing where they're at currently versus their future and needed skills allows us to craft some questions about what information is missing. Like what else do we need to know? And that's where potentially you're really gonna kind of zero in on some of your conversations or your ISP meeting, right? If we've already gathered a bunch of additional information and now maybe instead of, you know, the 200 and 25 fields or whatever it is in the my assessment now now maybe we really are just focusing in on 30 or 40 of them because we really want to dig in deep as to what this person uh, might need or what their goals are or how it relates to certain situations and then then we conduct a transition assessment again it could be a conversation it could be bringing in some additional behavior data or it could be uh, asking dsps uh, employment supervisor shift supervisor about um, some of the questions we might have and then that brings us back to the beginning, right? Is if we do all of this, and then we end up gathering and reviewing all of the existing information or new information that we have. So it just continues to kind of work itself around. So this is for planning for transition assessment, right? For school age, um, transition age youth, once they turn 14 as part of the IEP. But this process works with adults in the ISP system as well. It works at, 
if you're an OOD counselor, trying to understand kind of what their use are, what their skills are, where they want to go, what kind of assessments we might need to do. So this process is pretty universal uh, when it comes to supporting people with disabilities or, or really anyone and trying to determine some assessments. So what's the difference? I touched on this um, really briefly at the beginning, but uh, we kind of see assessments as these tools, right? Uh, for recording or documenting information. It's really important that we're intentional um, with what we're trying to capture and document. So the my assessment, the level of care, the DDP, these are all assessments that are gathering information about the person, right? And when we think about assessing, that's kind of the action or the process of how we're going to gather this information. Is it gonna be informational interviews? Is it gonna be some self-reflection or some different tools that we can give uh, the person we're supporting to get some of their um, goals and aspirations, some of their feedback on how things have been going, um, and as well as like situational observations, right? What is what does the behavior data tell us, or how are they? Uh, how can we talk with their employment provider, or their day program provider on like, you know, what's a, a a normal day look like for Alex, and and how does he navigate from task to task, staying on task, uh, social skills and other situations, being out in the community, uh, navigating public transit, whatever it could be. So. These are kind of the two differences and what we're going to talk about a bit more is that um, this assessing is not just kind of a one time thing that it needs to be ongoing and it needs to have a process to it and i'm going to um, share a bit more kind of about that now right I, I mentioned it, it needs to be multi perspective um, and it needs to include the individual first and foremost right. Uh, but it needs to include kind of their support system and team and folks that know them and some of their skills and needs. Um, it needs to be ongoing. It can't just be the one time a year. That's just a one snapshot, right? Um, if you took a snapshot of me last week, I was on vacation. That's going to look very different to my uh, preferences, interests, needs, and skills this week as I get back into the work week and the things that I need in order to kind of keep moving forward, uh, coffee being the main one. And then intentional, right? We need to know what we're trying to document. We need to make sure that we have the tools to document it, to gather that information um, and, and kind of crosswalk that into our compliance tools, right? Sometimes uh, the compliance tools like an ISP, an IEP, IP, they're not really, they're not written at a fourth grade level, which a lot of, which is what folks say should be kind of the standard reading level. Um, they're compliance documents. They're not um, really centered around the person or the family kind of participating with it or, or using it. It's really meant for professionals, um, but we do want to make sure that we can bring the information into it in a really intentional way by giving some um, maybe some chunking some tools or some more easy to use tools for our different team members. Okay. So, so far, so good. I'm gonna stop for a moment because I'm gonna have to change my screens here and just make sure, uh, let me see, check the Q&A real quick to make sure there's nothing in there. So far, so good, all right. So good, and I love mentees. You're gonna tell us, it's gonna be awesome. All right, so you'll see the code there and I'll also, I'm gonna change screens real quick. So bear with me while I try to bring Zoom back up. So we'll stop this share. Um, so for folks that maybe are new to Menti, um, you can use your phone if you have it in your hands. Uh, you can uh, use your um, you can use your computer that you're logged on to here with Zoom. Uh, but hopefully everyone's seeing the Menti right now um, and the question that we have on here. And then if you go to menti.com and use the code 14124974, um, you'll be able to then kind of see where we're at in the presentation. So uh, before we move on, I wanna cover kind of that first uh, like principle or bullet um, when we talk about assessing is it needs to be multi-perspective. It's not all on you, the SSA, to gather all of this information. There are opportunities for you to get it from other team members. So who may be able to provide data or information about the person you're coordinating services for. So uh, hopefully, folks, I see things coming in. So as, um, 
as these words get additional responses, right, they'll become bigger. So, so far, family is the biggest one right in the middle. That means that it has the most responses. Uh, so I appreciate, appreciate folks jumping in. So I see providers, right, the individual, individual themselves, friends, guardian, teacher, work supervisor, home staff, significant other, yes, DSP. This is wonderful. ADS provider, work group, home staff, the whole team, right? Yeah, anybody. I think oftentimes we forget because um, it's hard for DSPs to attend IEP or ISP meetings, right? So making sure that we give them tools to bring information, whether it's you know the, the shift supervisor, the home manager, whoever's participating from that provider, that they're getting information from some of the staff and DSPs that are working directly with the person because um, that's going to be kind of the, the richest information for us to put into the my assessment. Grandparents, I love this. Neighbor, this is really great. So yeah, a lot of people, siblings, this is really, really wonderful. I think people are, are right on track where it comes into um, making sure that we're bringing in all of these voices because uh, I don't know about you guys, I'm very different at work than I am at home. Um, so you see when uh, expectations are a little different, when the demands on that person and you know whether it's chores and um, personal care and things like that come into play, right? They change maybe um, some of their ability to be independent. Uh, one of my favorite uh, stories to share is a young man that I worked with when I worked at a school district. Um, I would, you know, I was, was first job out of college, paraprofessional on a work site would always open his lunch, open everything up, microwave it for him if it needed to be, so he was ready to go. And I remember going to the first IEP meeting and they were asking, oh, how are his like, you know, meal prep skills and things like that? Oh, he's great. He always, once a week, he makes dinner for the family. I'm like, what, what does that include? He's like, oh, the oven and the stove and all that. I was like, he makes me microwave his lunch. I was like, yeah, he's pulling one over on you. Uh, so it, once you bring in all these perspectives too, right, the, the expectations can change in different settings, right? DSPs might take a step back in certain instances in order to really uh, allow that person to uh, be as independent as possible. Tanya, all right, this is I don't know if it's Tanya or Tanaya, but she said she attended a meeting where the person invited about 10 people to contribute at his ISP meeting. He literally invited the cashier from the right oh. eight. He walked to daily. That's awesome. And he attended? I mean, that... I think that that goes to show that there are a lot and I see Kay here natural supports right there are a lot of people that interact with the people we serve on a daily basis right. SSA is it's impossible for us to interact with folks on a daily basis right, but there are people that have really great information that see you know Lisa and Alex every day that can really contribute to this discussion. And whether they attend a meeting or we give them some tools to share their perspective, um, you know, we want to meet people where they're at and their availability to kind of join the conversation. That's great. Yeah, coworkers attending ISP meetings. That's great. Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna see if I can stop this share. We're, we're, we're going back and forth here, so bear with me for a moment. You're but thank impressive. you. It's hard to switch screens during the middle. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Here. So we'll get back to kind of our, our presentation. So thank you again. I'll, I will, for all the mentees that we do today, I'll make sure I kind of download them and put them into PDFs and, and include them um, with some follow-up. That way you guys can have all of this information as well. All right, so we're, we're back here again. Thank you for participating in that. So we kind of check our box here about assessing, right? It needs to be multi-perspective. Not every coworker can attend the ISP meeting, right? It's a specific day and time. What are other opportunities in order to maybe engage them, right? Um, so we, we have one more mentee here. So when might you be able to gather information from all of these team members, right? When we think about, um, trying to engage people outside of an ISP meeting, when are other opportunities that you could potentially engage some of uh, a, a person's team, mem team and team members? Let's try this one more time. Perfect. All right. 
right, so hopefully folks are seeing the when, right? Um, and I already see at visits, right? Quarterly monitoring, home visits, during monitoring, community functions, yes. Even after hours, during trips to the coffee shop, 100%. Monitoring, monitoring, pre-planning meeting, ooh, how many folks do those? That's great. Uh-oh. I, we have found an acronym that I am not familiar with. CQRs. Care to take a stab at that one, Lisa? Yeah, it's my. It's another name for monitoring. It's continuous okay. quality review. It's Ooh, okay. Review. Yeah. At sporting events, right? Yeah, meeting folks where they're at. We don't have to set up an additional meeting, right? Like if folks are planning to go to the local high school basketball game or are have a special Olympics practice, what a what a great way to kind of see them in a different setting uh, in order to kind of engage folks where they're at. Texting, email, yes, great to see the technology. Community outings, visits to their ADS or work. This is wonderful. Trends and patterns from post-doctor appointment forms. Wow, that's wonderful, yeah. Having lunch together. I used to challenge a young man on my, uh, on my caseload to the Asian buffet and who could eat the most plates. He beat me every time. The grocery store, FaceTime, yes. Using FaceTime and Zooms, those virtual meeting spaces, right? We don't have to drive out or make people drive to us at all times. We can have, find opportunities, go for a walk. Yeah, what a wonderful way to, to get some really informal conversation going and really get down into what people think about. What are their goals and aspirations? How are they feeling about where they're living, who serves them, what they want to do um, next in their employment journey. This is all great, this is really great. Meeting somebody after a shift, right? Um, anywhere except the county office, yes, 100%. Provider documentation, yes. Oh, this is this is all very wonderful. I think trying to get creative with. How we how we do it? Let me get the acronym right. CQRs, right? If it's after you know a shift at work, and and then maybe grabbing lunch or coffee, or it's um, at a sporting event, or it's going for a walk, right? Meeting them in their community, seeing how their new apartment is going. Um, I think these are all like really really wonderful, fun get to know you cards. There are some really cool uh, conversation starters like card decks if you you know run out of things to talk about or want to give someone a few options on things they want to chat about during your walk that's that's a great way to kind of get things rolling. This is great. All right. So Some of the counties i'm not sure if it's who put that in there about the get to know you cards, but we have a couple counties who've actually like printed up and made their own amazing cards on nice. with different questions and good ways to know. So that's a, I can't think of the real name of it. We, they did a session at one of our conferences. Yeah, that's great. I mean, allowing folks to kind of choose their own adventure, right? And then having some places to start. Um, I think that's a great way to really get to know folks. I'm, I'm gonna touch on it a bit more later, but even just sharing about yourself People want to know who you are. People are always looking for common ground. They want to find commonalities, whether it's you have the same number of siblings, you've had a similar vacation, you're from a similar part of the state maybe, or from a wholly different state, but people are looking to find connection and commonality. So sharing about yourself during this process is, is a huge component of developing those relationships. All right, let me make sure. Spark cards. Thank you, Clarissa. Then there's yeah. an app called Flip Flash. Yes. Yeah. Judy Brent mentioned that. Yeah, the spark cards were a bunch of a couple of different counties that created those, but I haven't heard of Flip Flash, Judy. Yeah, and Melissa shared that she thinks SSAs need to spend more time with their folks to learn about them as the paperwork becomes too much. 100%. I think there's, there's only so much you can learn. We certainly want to try to document what we can. Um, for the, you know, for the next SSA, for the provider, um, for those team conversations when we all come together, but spending time with folks and, and learning a bit more about them and 
sometimes it's meeting them in the community, which can feel like a more safe and neutral space instead of invading them in their home a little bit. So sometimes you get a little bit more when you're meeting in a place of their choosing where they want to be. Um, because, you know, my home is not always visitor ready. I've got two young kids. So at any point in time, it may not be ready for an impromptu visit or uh, even a scheduled visit. So I could, that can lead to a lot of anxiety. So thank you all for, for sharing. I really appreciate that. So we've, we've kind of checked a bit here, right? It needs to be multi-perspective um, and it needs to be ongoing. And we found different times that we could do this. So now um, a big part of the, the, the training here today is gonna to be around this intentionality, right? How can we document it? It sounds like we've got some good tools on Spark cards. Um, we have some other tools um, around uh, Flip Flash, but I'm gonna share some, maybe some tools that you can distribute to some of the team members. You can give to the person themselves. Um, you can take with you. Um, so uh, if you did get the um, PowerPoint in advance, all of the links are live and then as I go through these subsequent slides, all of the images are also like clickable links. So you don't have to remember all of the names of these tools. If you just see the, the um, image in your PDF and you click that, that'll get you to where you need to go so you can download these tools. But we're gonna go over um, these five tools. This is not like an all and, and you know a comprehensive list of every single tool. These are just some that we've developed these are some that some of the teams um, and around the state that we work with have developed based off of some of the needs they've identified. Um, and then we have one from SCLN, um, uh, which is a national network on employment. Um, so these are all kind of readily available, all free, um, and, and they're all linked here. So the first one I'll share is what we call our PINs Foursquare. Um, so this is a fillable form. Um, you can, um, again, give it to the person themselves to talk a little bit about who they want to spend time with, what they choose to do during their free time, what fascinates them. Um, so it's kind of a person centered um, tool, but you can also give this to different team members or different um, providers that are, in, are engaged in serving that person in order to get that that big perspective and big picture of the person. You can also give it to caregivers, natural supports, family members, other folks that are working with um, the person you're serving, but this is a, just a really simple, easy way. A lot of this stuff is covered in the My Assessment, so it should be a really easy crosswalk over into some of your tools um, and ISP forms. But this might be a really good place to start. Um, and, and one of the other one of the other items um, that we share sometimes is doing these tools on yourself can get you familiar with like what you might end up getting what you can look for, as well as a way to maybe even do it yourself, send it out with a blank one and say, here's me, I want to learn more about you. Um, and it allows folks to really meet you where you're at um, and get to know you a bit, especially if you're a new SSA or new to that team. Um, it's just a, a really nice way to kind of uh, introduce yourself. Um, so the next uh, tool I'll share, this is uh, much more kind of skill focus. So this is the employability and life skills assessment, often called the ELSA. I promise this came out before Frozen. Uh, this is not uh, not just based off of the, the Disney movie, um, but it's it's got three pages here. It's got kind of a how-to page. And then there are these kind of self-help or independent living uh, skills. There are some general work habits. Um, but there are a bunch of different domains and you can see whether you use this aid, you can edit it and change it yourself. You can just use it during home visits, you can use it year over year, you can give it to the different team members and just get all the different perspectives. Um, it's a really flexible tool, you should be able to kind of change and edit it. Um, but it's really helpful just to see again, where are folks with their cleanliness um, with some of their independent living skills around maybe meal prep or um, moving from task to task, staying on task, um, safe use of uh, transportation or rideshare apps. Um, so again, a, a really nice way to maybe um, get that full picture and you're not just relying on, um, on an opportunity to uh, go through the ISP documents, but you're, you're kind of chunking this information. You could even just, um, there are several domains, you could kind of go domain by domain through some of your uh, quarterly monitoring visits and um, different opportunities to gather information. 
Uh, I see uh, Melissa in the chat says she used this often when she was an intervention specialist. So it's a great way, a uh, great visual for data. Um, I agree, it's, it's really easy to use. You, you don't have to score it. There is a scoring rubric at the top. You can see here, um, three, two, one, and zero. You can score it, but you know, again, this is just an opportunity maybe for goals, right? If we have maybe a seldom or a never, maybe these become goals with um, the HPC provider or the ADS provider. Um, if we're really um, showing a need in some work habits and we're with our vocab provider still, right? This might be some justification as to why we might extend those services for a, a couple more years um, as we try to move them towards competitive integrated employment. Uh, so just a, a really nice way to kind of bring in um, some really specific skills and conversations around um, the person you're serving. This next tool uh, covers a lot of similar information. It was developed by the Columbiana County MAP team um, who had um, a, a problem or an issue with um, a student receiving services with the school, with OOD Summer Youth, maybe um, their county board had also done some job development or some discovery. Um, everyone was kind of using their own form. So what they did was they tried to have one universal form in order to allow everyone to document the different experiences a youth was having. Again, this can be used for adults, um, but it, it goes over you know, different social uh, behavior and communication, work appearances, The uh, second page talks about job performance, and then there's even some preferences in here, which get covered uh, in the My Assessment. And then uh, the kind of bottom right table there around accommodations and interventions and prompts used, right? Like, how are we supporting this person? Um, if we have a bunch of picture checklists at work, but we're maybe not using them at home for, you know, brushing your teeth or meal prep, maybe that's something we can uh, begin to leverage at home if it's working in the, in the work setting. Uh, so just another opportunity to document kind of how people are being supported and what they're being supported with um, when it comes to some of these different employ employability skills and social skills. And then the, the third and final page um, has what they call conditions for success. So adding a little bit of narrative too. So it's not just kind of this, um, this table tool and it's not just numbers, but really giving folks a chance to um, add some narrative as well as any recommendations around employment or even uh, independent living skills, you guys can, again, adjust, uh, edit, change these as you need to based on the people you're serving. Um, you know, none, I don't think any of these are like locked down. So you uh, do have the opportunity to kind of make them your own based off of whether it's your county, um, your caseload, or even just the actual person you're working with. All right, so charting the life course tools. I, I know uh, we have a lot of folks familiar with them. I'm curious, do we have folks that are like familiar with charting the life course? Do we have any ambassadors or people have received any training? If you want to just add into the chat, like your familiarity with charting the life course, you know, a little, a lot, you're a full on ambassador. I know we have a lot of those around the state. Um, that'll give me kind of an idea of how much to potentially cover, I'll still cover it a lot. I've got a really great example in here. Um, I think a lot of folks um, find these really easy to use both uh, as a professional, but as like giving them to team members and the, the um, person you're serving as well, because they can, they're really graphic heavy, which is nice. Um, and they're, they're very straightforward with their language. So I see some training, I see some used often. That's great, a little bit. Ashley's been using them regularly with her transition age youth. That's great to hear. Shout out to Columbiana County. We've got a nun, so it's kind of all yeah. over the board, a little bit familiar. I always use more. Yeah, I will say um, if you're interested, there are a bunch of online learning opportunities, right? I don't, at least I don't know if OACB sponsors any or does any, but I know like FRNO is the Family Resource Network of Ohio. I know Barb Saferis does a lot as well, OSU, Ohio State. And a lot of them are virtual, you know, they have different levels, right? As far as an ambassador is a lot of training, there's guided implementation, there's, you know, charting life course in the IEP. So there are a lot of opportunities to get familiar and comfortable with them. Um, so I would encourage folks 
to uh, find some of those opportunities if you would like to learn more uh, after today's training. Yeah, and definitely reach out to me. I can always link you with somebody who is a trainer or an ambassador. I have a lot of connections. Um, I know OACB hosted a few things. We tend to get a lot of the youth and transition age at those trainings, but I would really invite you all to listen to Alex because with the Ohio ISP, if you use some of these tools ahead of time, you're going to be way ahead um, since they took questions right from there. So yes. um, yeah, so I, the adult, it doesn't matter. It's, it's throughout the lifespan. So yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a great, um, great segue here. You can see like on the bottom, the circular icons, right. Goes across all the life stages. We have kind of that infancy and toddler school age transition with uh, some captain um, cap and gowns. We have young adult and kind of older adult. Um, so they have guides for each of the different life stages and how you can use some of these tools and some really sample, really great sample questions and conversation starters. Um, but the big visual here with the star behind it, right, it kind of starts with the person in the middle. That's the um, really bright white silhouette. And then you see kind of in the context of their family or natural supports and caregivers. And then you have the considerations for the life domains. Um, I'll show you a, a life domains tool, but it talks about, you know, you see daily life and employment kind of front and center. And then working around, you've got social and spirituality, safety and security community living, healthy living, and then advocacy and engagement. So thinking about these different life domains of the person. And then um, on top of that are kind of these connections and supports, discovery and navigation, goods and services. And then we get into kind of the integrated star, which I, I didn't share today, but is a another wonderful tool around kind of those personal strengths. You see them on the very outside with the tip of the stars, relationship based, eligibility specific, community-based and technology, right? So it's thinking really holistically about what is available in the community or the community center, the library, uh, what kind of technology might they use? What personal strengths do they bring to the table? Relationship-based, right? Those coworkers and other natural supports before we even talk about eligibility specific tools and resources, right? Because there are a lot of things available in the community that our people that we serve have access to just like anyone else. And we don't wanna maybe create these kind of separate disability focused things when community inclusion is what they want, right? They want to be out in the community volunteering um, or joining a social group or playing you know, tennis at the local tennis club, whatever it could be. We wanna make sure that we're identifying some of those things. So this, the Charting Life Course Tools does a really great job of that. So I'll share um, just real briefly on these. Um, so the, the life course tools are lifecoursetools.com. Again, this is all linked in the PowerPoints. Um, oh, I clicked it again. So if you kind of click the top here, you'll see it's kind of yellow now, these life course library button at the top. Um, that'll get you into a lot of these tools that I'm talking about. Uh, and the first one I really want to dig in on is this life trajectory. Um, there are some great prompts in these. And uh, what we find sometimes is when we talk about goals or visions or what people want, sometimes it can be really difficult to think about that, especially in the moment. Um, but sometimes it's easy to think about what I don't want, right? Like I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to be kind of disenfranchised or I don't want to be alone. I want to I don't want to, um, you know, live with a lot of people, right? I don't want to have um, a lot of providers in and out of my house, right? So you can think about what don't we want, and then we can start to maybe build that vision of what uh, we want for that good life. So um, as you click through, this is just a quick example. Um, this is a transition example, but I think a lot of this is going to ring true and would be uh, answers that adults would have too. Um, so the vision that Mira wants um, is that she wants to stay close to her parents, but live on her own. She's not sure about a, a friend or a roommate. She wants to have a boyfriend, go on vacations and visit Paris, uh, opportunities to sing. Uh, she wants to do karaoke and the women's chorus and community musicals, college maybe, uh, she's not sure. And she wants a fun job, uh, maybe in a coffee shop or a clothing store. And then what she doesn't want, she doesn't want to be lonely or bored or live with her parents forever. 
Uh, she doesn't want to lose touch with her best friends or have a job she hates. Um, so you can kind of uh, work then backwards on, all right, what are some life experiences and events that have supported this vision? Um, she had a solo in the choir concert. She moved to a new house a few months ago, and now she can walk and ride her bike more places. Uh, moving forward, she wants to go to art camp. And then her older sister is looking at colleges, and she's learning about what college might look like and what she would need to do if she wanted to go. Uh, so I'll keep clicking that. Uh, so other past life experiences that maybe pushed her away from this trajectory, um, mostly seeing her friends through her at school and she gets bored or lonely during the holiday breaks, um, trying to avoid her chores at home, which sounds a lot like my children, um, and not always having kind of things to do or know what to do on her own. So the reason I bring this up is these are great places to kind of ask some follow up questions right if you get this completed tool back or if you send it out in advance of a, a quarterly visit and you say hey here's mine right here I filled mine out or here's an example of what it might look like. And then you can take some of these visions and say well kind of what appeals to you about college, is it just because your sister is looking at colleges or is there a certain thing you want to learn. Is there a certain college campus you want to go to? Have you thought about what you want to study? Uh, so there are great opportunities for follow up questions and then. Um, you know she talks about a fun job right well what interests you about these jobs, why are they fun, what would be fun about working in a coffee shop or a clothing store. Um, and then she doesn't want a job that she hates well, what would some of those be right like name a job you might hate and why. Like maybe it's a, a job in a loud setting or maybe it's a job working with a lot of people or. Um, there could be uh, certain times of day that she doesn't want to work in the evenings or in the summertime, whatever it could be. But these are just great ways to kind of continue those conversations. So if you don't have the kind of the, the spark cards or some of these other things and you get an opportunity to hand these tools out in advance, it can really lead to like a great visit or a great conversation. Again, you can have multiple people do these. So uh, if Mira was kind of living at home, I'm going to go back here. If Mira was living at home, right, and we had her parents maybe fill this out, it might be interesting to see what their vision for a good life was, right? If she wants to move out uh, but stay close, I'd be curious to know, like, what her family wants. If they want her to move out on the same timeline or if they think that she should stay and if they have different reasons for that. Um, it's always interesting to get different perspectives on these tools um, because it just leads to better conversation and good follow-up questions. Just while you're moving ahead, I, I did yeah. just put the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint in the chat box just now. So at 2.45, you can see it there if you get lost. Oh, but perfect. And feel free to download it. Um, it's not on the Member Connect yet, but it will be, so. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can, I'll make sure also, I'll add the Menti stuff to the back end of it. So that okay. way it's all kind of in one. That way when it gets added to Member Connect, you can all have it. That's perfect. Um, so as I mentioned in that that big kind of somewhat busy uh, image um, on the on the starting slide of the charting the life course section here, we talked about life domains. Um, so it's important, right, that we're not always whether it's focused on employment or maybe focused on safety, but really giving all these different domains some time and energy and the opportunity to be discussed by all the team members, especially the person, right? If even if it is just giving them this tool and say, what are like, what are your priorities? Like, where do we want to really focus our conversation or our goals on this year? Um, what, where are some things that maybe you're missing that um, you wish you had more of? Um, these are just, again, great ways to kind of pivot the conversation a little bit or to make sure that you're covering all that really important information about that person and who they are. Um, so there, there are a lot of different um, life domain tools. This is their vision tool which allows folks here, the column says, my vision for my future. Uh, what do I think I will do or want to do during the day in my adult life? Or what kind of job or career do I want? So there's some really good kind of starting questions around uh, how will I live a healthy lifestyle and manage my healthcare supports in my adult life, right? Just a, a really great way to um, start some of that conversation and see who's supporting them in that space uh, and what, they, what skills they bring to these different domains. 
And again, just for in case you guys haven't figured this out, these are the exact same domains that are in the Ohio ISP. So we almost have a way to go through and actually monitor the different areas, do a little assessing, a little, you know, especially when you look at some of those areas and you think, man, I don't have any information about this person in this area. Some of them you'll know everything about, but then other ones you might not. So it'd be great like to make a goal for yourself to do a monitoring or CQR and just use some of the tools that, you know, go along with these life domains and they're already all made for you. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. And, and there are some great like visuals here. There are, like I said, many more tools that talk about these life domains. So um, it's a great way to identify. Yeah. If you have sections in your ISP or my assessment that are a little bare, maybe digging into that section of charting the life course and finding some more conversation starters and questions. Um, you'll find them in the, the life stages guide broken up by domain and then also the, some of these life domain tools. Yeah, I don't think that was by accident, right? That all of this stuff. No, not at all. Yeah. Rest assured for those of you who said, I, you know, I only know a little, or I've only gone to one or two trainings, which is similar to me, by the way, um, there, this isn't going to go away. Um, uh, the, the life course tools there's, I just got off a call this morning, um, where there's some pretty cool things happening for, um, Nexus and, and the Ohio department of DD teaming up regarding online, um, availability to create really cool things with charting the life course. So, um, I wouldn't, I would, I would spend some time in 2024 and 2025 feeling a lot more comfortable with it because it's pretty cool. Yeah. And they're, they're, um, Put this as nicely as I can. They're not as dense, maybe, as the ISP in my assessment, right? So that it's easier to chunk. It's families and people we serve won't get overwhelmed by some of these tools. Like if you gave them a page or two of the my assessment, right? You might think like, "Whoa, there's a lot going on here. It's very dense. This is a little more visual heavy, a little more broken down." Um, and then maybe able to kind of chunk these into the different visits throughout the year. All right, the last tool I'll talk about is the SELN, which is, I think, the Supported Employment Leadership Network, um, which is kind of a network of states and universities. Um, it's, it's probably going on five to 10 years old now, uh, but they, they put together this um, really robust um, set of conversation worksheets, right? And they, they follow these four different uh, kind of topics, right? The role of the case manager and that being kind of a very universal term. Again, whether you're from a county board, uh, you're you're an OOD counselor, um, you're a mental health uh, case manager, right? What is that role of like managing and helping support this person? Some really great questions in there, some really great worksheets, again, that are like four or five questions that you can give out to team members or you can even take with you during your, your quarterly visits or your CQRs uh, in order to kind of get some of this information. There's some great starting the conversation worksheets. Uh, the focusing on the destination is, is all employment kind of driven, right? So where are we going and how are we gonna get there? And then career success, again, is another layer of employment questions when conversation worksheets. So um, these are all on the Ohio Employment First website. Again, if you click this image in the PowerPoint slides in the PDF, you should get there as well as the, the first slide I had where it had all the live links kind of bulleted out. Um, so you'll, you can find the big guide that talks a bit about using them and how and when, and then also just some of the worksheets uh, that you can download and, and use. Um, they're really nice because uh, they're like the lines are big. So it's a really easy tool to, to like physically write on. Um, it's a really big, big, easy um, kind of format. Uh, so. As we work through all of these, right, we talk about assessing and, and not waiting till the ISP meeting, not trying to jam it all in one 90 minute, two hour, sometimes ends up being three hours. I think my first, my first ISP meeting as an SSA was way too long. And I did what every first time SSA does. I read all the questions, right? Uh, but if you find a way to engage all the team members, right? We talked about who we could engage so we've checked that multi-perspective box. We talk about these different opportunities to be ongoing throughout the year, and we're not waiting just for the, the ISP meeting or even just the pre-planning meeting, right? Finding opportunities throughout the year to really be ongoing with our data collection 
and trying to get this information and then being intentional, right? Um, Lisa brought up a good point. All of the charting the life course domains kind of align with the my assessment. So if I have some really great information in some areas, but I'm really lacking in others, then let's be intentional about what we're trying to capture during some of our quarterly visits to make um, the ISP meeting maybe run a little smoother or not end up with uh, you know a big blind spot when we end uh, and not I'm sure about you know a certain uh, perspective or um, domain of a person's life. Uh, so yeah, if we if we kind of chunk these throughout the year, we should get that really big picture. Um, and we should be able to do that planning portion of the IEP together in a much more kind of comfortable and easy way. Um, so um, some other ideas that you, you touched on these a lot, but kind of make these tools your own. You can email them out to get multiple perspectives. You can simply just pull some of these questions off of the prompts when you call someone or you check in. You can just kind of copy and paste some of these questions. You don't have to actually use the tool itself. But you can also bring these tools to meetings and visits and uh, document team discussion. Make sure that you're capturing some of the domains um, if that's where your where your mind is at. Um, so again, these are all really flexible. They're meant to be um, uh, used in a variety of settings, not just with transition youth, but with kind of adults uh, and people throughout the the life stages. Uh, so as, as we kind of wrap up this part uh, i do want to share a link in the chat so research shows and i will say i've become a bit of a research nerd um research shows that if you make a plan to use something then you'll actually use it which kind of sounds funny when you say it out loud um, but oftentimes we come to trainings whether it's a conference whether it's a virtual training um, and we hear a lot of great information but sometimes we're multitasking. Uh, sometimes we're it's at that very end of the day. And as soon as this is over, I'm out. Um, and then tomorrow morning, I'm doing a home visit or a CQR, whatever it could be. Uh, so I, I put together a very simple table. It has all the tools linked in at the top, um, but it has these prompts as well as an additional one on when. So if you take, um, we'll say 10 minutes, we'll come back at like 3.06. If you think about folks on your caseload or think about upcoming meetings, um, you think about folks that maybe you don't know enough about, um, or maybe someone that has an ISP meeting coming up in the next, you know, 90, 120 days, what have you, uh, which tools would you like to try with one of your teams? I'm thinking of the, the five that we introduced. Um, which team members will you share it with? Um, how will you share this new tool or idea with the team, right? Are you going to send it out via email? Are you going to give them a phone call, print it off and mail it out to them? Um, and then when are you going to do this? Will you do this later this week? Um, will you do it at your behavior support meeting on Thursday? Whatever it could be. Um, but I want to give folks an opportunity to quickly just make a plan. How are you going to incorporate some of these tools and practices um, into your work day, whether it's this week or next week, uh, in order to um, do a favor for your future self? So making sure that you're um, kind of being a little planful and intentional. So awesome. my clock says 2.57, so maybe come back at 3.05, give people about eight minutes. Sounds great. All right. I'm going to turn my camera off so you don't have to stare at us while we do that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. What a great tool. All right. We'll see you guys at 3.05. Open that tool up. It's in the chat box and he asks, he does all the work for you. All you got to do is type in a few things. Yeah. And if you want to just jot it down on post-its, right? If you're if your mind works off of post-its and you just you know put them on your monitor, if you have other scrap paper, if you have a Word doc open that you have your list of to-dos, how if you don't have to use this tool, that's fine. But the prompts are here on the on the screen as well as in there. Um, and we'll come back yeah, in a few minutes and then we'll queue up a, a fun video for folks.
we'll give folks here roughly like a two minute warning, not quite. Um, and then also seeing uh, Aaron in the chat. Um, if you want us to put our answers in the chat, sure. We'll, uh, we'll hold you accountable. I'll follow up with all of you a week from now to make sure that you have done this favor for yourself. Um, but yeah, if you want to put it in there, I think it'd be great for others to see how you plan to use the tools um, and when and how. Um, so yeah, feel free. You're not obligated to, but I think it's always good to see what other people are doing. So two minute warning and then we will, we'll come back. All right. Looks like some folks are kind of joining together, which is great. Seeing a lot of use for the vocational planning and the ELSA for some, maybe like some career discovery or some employment navigation meetings, some pre-planning meetings. Um, the life trajectory form is great for starting that employment journey, charting a life course, the PINS four square, plans on using it with um, new folks on her caseload and all new team members. Yeah, quick non-invasive tool that can be done in a short amount of time. That's that's the aim, right? We don't want to give people folks that they have to take an hour out of their day. Something that's really simple and straightforward. Um, the four pins of the SCLN charting the life course. Some folks are already attending the charting the life course training on Thursday. There you go. This will be great. Yeah, the pins four squares. It's one of my favorites. Um, I've, I've got uh, what will be a third grader and fifth grader, and I've given them these tools, right, just as a way to talk about some of how they see themselves, what struggles they might have, uh, how they plan to set goals for themselves for the school year. Um, so it's it, they're really, really helpful tools just to get organized uh, and be able to have some really intentional conversations. So. Uh, thank you all for kind of sharing. If you want to continue in the chat, I'm going to bring up uh, a video next. We'll do our my final uh, screen change here. So far, so good. Um, so this is um, Celeste. Oh, let's see. Yeah, let's use it. All right, hopefully everyone's seeing that. Um, this is Celeshi is uh, an interviewer on NPR, um, but uh, this is a video we've used for several other trainings. It's, it's a component of the Establishing Families as Partners training, which is a family engagement training in order to make sure that we're doing that family engagement and outreach and preparation during the school years uh, in a really intentional and evidence-based way. Um, so this video, uh, it's about seven minutes long. Uh, she's going to go over the 10 rules and then we'll chat a little bit more afterwards. So I have 10 basic rules. I'm going to walk you through all of them. But honestly, if you just choose one of them and master it, you're already going to enjoy better conversations. Number one, 
don't multitask. And I don't mean just set down your cell phone or your tablet or your car keys or whatever's in your hand. I mean, be present. Be in that moment. Don't be thinking about your argument you have with your boss. Don't be thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. If you want to get out of the conversation, get out of the conversation. But don't be half in it and half out of it. Number two, don't pontificate. If you wanted to state your opinion without any opportunity for response or argument or pushback or growth, write a blog. <laughs> Now, there's a really good reason why I don't allow pundits on my show, because they're really boring. If they're a conservative, they're going to hate Obama and food stamps and abortion. If they're a liberal, they're going to hate big banks and oil corporations and Dick Cheney. <coughs> totally predictable. And you don't want to be like that. You need to enter every conversation assuming that you have something to learn. The famed therapist Eb Scott Peck said that true listening requires a setting aside of oneself. And sometimes that means setting aside your personal opinion. He said that sensing this acceptance, the speaker will become less and less vulnerable and more and more likely to open up the inner recesses of his or her mind to the listener. Again, assume that you have something to learn. Bill Nye, everyone you will ever meet knows something that you don't. I put it this way, everybody is an expert in something. Number three, use open-ended questions. In this case, take a cue from journalists. Start your questions with who, what, where, when, why, or how. If you put in a complicated question, you're going to get a simple answer out. If I ask you, were you terrified? You're going to respond to the most powerful word in that sentence, which is terrified. And the answer is, yes, I was, or no, I wasn't. Were you angry? Yes, I was very angry. Let them describe it. They're the ones that know. Try asking them things like, what was that like? How did that feel? Because then they might have to stop for a moment and think about it. And you're going to get a much more interesting response. Number four, go with the flow. That means thoughts will come into your mind, and you need to let them go out of your mind. We've heard interviews often in which a guest is talking for several minutes, and then the host comes back in and asks a question which seems like it comes out of nowhere, or it's already been answered. That means the host probably stopped listening two minutes ago because he thought of this really clever question, and he was just bound and determined to say that. And we do the exact same thing. We're sitting there having a conversation with someone, and then we remember that time that we met Hugh Jackman in a coffee shop. <laughs> And we stop listening. Stories and ideas are going to come to you. You need to let them come and let them go. Number five, if you don't know, say that you don't know. Now, people on the radio, especially on NPR, are much more aware that they're going on the record. And so they're more careful about what they claim to be an expert in and what they claim to know for sure. Do that. Err on the side of caution. Talk should not be cheap. Number six, don't equate your experience with theirs. If they're talking about having lost a family member, don't start talking about the time that you lost a family member. If they're talking about the trouble that they're having at work, don't tell them about how much you hate your job. It's not the same. It is never the same. All experiences are individual. And more importantly, it is not about you. You don't need to take that moment to prove how amazing you are or how much you've suffered. Somebody asked Stephen Hawking once what his IQ was, and he says, I have no idea. People who brag about their IQs are losers. <laughs> Conversations are not a promotional opportunity. <laughs> Number seven, <laughs> try not to repeat yourself. It's condescending, and it's really boring, and we tend to do it a lot, especially in work conversations or in conversations with our kids. We have a point to make, so we just keep rephrasing it over and over. Don't do that. Number eight, stay out of the weeds. Frankly, people don't care about the years, the names, the dates, all those details that you're struggling to come up with in your mind. They don't care. What they care about is you. They care about what you're like, what you have in common. So forget the details. Leave them out. Number nine, this is not the last one, but it is the most important one. Listen. I cannot tell you how many really important people have said that listening is perhaps the most, the number one most important skill that you could develop. Buddha said, and I'm paraphrasing, if your mouth is open, you're not learning. 
And Calvin Coolidge said, no man ever listened his way out of a job. <laughs> Why do we not listen to each other? Number one, we'd rather talk. When I'm talking, I'm in control. I don't have to hear anything I'm not interested in. I'm the center of attention. I can bolster my own identity. But there's another reason. We get distracted. The average person talks at about 225 words per minute, but we can listen at up to 500 words per minute. So our minds are filling in those other 275 words. And look, I know it takes effort and energy to actually pay attention to someone. But if you can't do that, you're not in a conversation. You're just two people shouting out barely related sentences in the same place. <laughs> You have, to, you have to listen to one another. Stephen Covey said it very beautifully. He said, most of us don't listen with the intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply. One more rule, and number 10, and it's this one. Be brief. this boils down to the same basic concept, and it is this one. Be interested in other people. You know, I grew up with a very famous grandfather, and there was kind of a ritual in my home. People would come over to talk to my grandparents, and after they would leave, my mother would come over to us, and she'd say, do you know who that was? She was the runner-up to Miss America. He was the mayor of Sacramento. She won a Pulitzer Prize. He's a Russian ballet dancer. And I started, I kind of grew up assuming Everyone has some hidden amazing thing about them. And I, honestly, I think it's what makes me a better host. I keep my mouth shut as often as I possibly can. I keep my mind open, and I'm always prepared to be amazed. And I'm never disappointed. You do the same thing. Go out, talk to people, listen to people, and most importantly, be prepared to be amazed. Thanks. All right, so I apologize that it's a little bit of a long video, but I, I, I can't cover that content any better than Celeste does. I think she does a really great job of moving through it. Um, so I, it, is one of, it is one of my favorites, right? I think a lot of times um, these listening skills, and I think it comes through in the SELN guided conversation is that role of the case manager. We're really, we're a conduit, right? We are trying to get information we're trying to authorize service. We're trying to organize and coordinate things. Um, so listening is such a huge part of that. And, and hopefully with some of the tools that we talked about and the partners that we can engage and the team members' voices that we can bring into the conversation to paint that full picture, combined with some of these um, 10 uh, lessons for a, a really great conversation, hopefully that allows us to really help kind of move some of our work forward as an SSA. So um, so kind of one of the final um, opportunities here that I'd like to do um, is see what you guys think as far as which rule for a good conversation is the most difficult to follow. Which one do you have the most difficulty with? Uh, so again, this is at the same place, menti.com. It's got the same code. If you're logged in on your phone or you have the browser still open, um, there should be an opportunity to um, just kind of click next now that I've, I've gone to the next slide. Um, but I, I think um, I think a lot of times uh, when, when I'm in trainings or when we, we have discussions, right, we think of like which one is is our favorite, um, which is has a great place in and of itself. But I think identifying and taking a moment to kind of think critically, like what what do I probably have a hard time with, right? Like what what could I be better at? Because that'll give us again an opportunity to be intentional on what we're going to work on on our next home visit, our next conversation, our next quarterly visit. So so far, I've seen don't multitask. Uh, I think Celeste. Celeste brings up a great point about your brain, right? Like some of it is just, it's not that we're being disrespectful. It's just that our brain can listen at a much faster pace than it can talk. So your brain tries to find other things to fill itself up. I always laugh, right? When I sometimes walk into a room and like the TV's on, but someone's on their phone, it's like, which one are you listening to? It's like, I'm listening to both. It's like, that's crazy. How do you do that? But our brains are really sophisticated 
and their ability to kind of take in information. Did you walk into my house, Alex, when I wasn't paying attention? <laughs> I no, 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 no. All the time with the television and everybody yells at me. <laughs> it, it happens, right? It, I think knowing the science behind it, you can give yourself a little grace to be like, oh, it's just my, it's because my brain's so good. So there I you see, go, don't, asking and don't equate your experience with theirs. I love that one too. And I think I would agree. Like these two are really hard. Anytime you hear someone talk about something that tangentially talks about something that you've done or an experience that you've had, right? Immediately your brain goes, oh, I've done that. I'm going to share that. But I think it goes back to the other um, principle or other rule here about go with the flow, right? There might be a time to jump in with that conversation or to, to share about yourself, right? We talked about that. It's going to be hard to, um, to share about yourself while also like, you know, not repeating yourself or staying out of the weeds, right? There's going to be some weird contradictions with these rules, but sometimes the conversation goes on and you don't have an opportunity to share about your trip to Tahiti and that's okay. Maybe it'll happen next time, right? We hope that we're working with these teams and these people for a long time, for years even. Um, so it's okay that you don't get to share everything about yourself in the very first visit or when that topic comes up, sometimes you just have to go with the flow. I like Whitney's comment. She said that um, sometimes when we mention our own experiences, it is because we are attempting to show understanding and it's nice for people to know that they're not alone. Um, and it is it, there. I mean, it's a very common thing and there. I'm sure there's a way to do it without trying to compare your experience um, or equate your experience as, as they said. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Sometimes it almost feels like a one-up, right? Like you, someone shares and then you share on top of it. Right. But there is a place to like, say, you know, I, I understand what you're going through. I've been through something similar and I'm, I'm sorry that happened to you. Right. Sometimes it's just acknowledging where they're at and then saying, you know, I, I, I feel that as well. Be brief. As you guys sit through 90 minutes of me talking, this is probably one of my more difficult ones as well. Oh, definitely mine. I, I, I could have picked five of these minimum. That was the only thing I'm good at is going with the flow, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's a good one, right? Like making sure that you're kind of allowing the conversation to go where it does. Um, there's this, there's this little neat um, a concept out there called serendipitous browsing, where everyone has done it, right? You see someone on the screen, you go, ooh, who is that? What actor is that actress? Oh, they're in this movie. Oh, I wonder who directed that movie. Or when did that movie come out? What else? Oh, did it win any awards? And you get down this like weird rabbit hole and you end up finding and going through this information in a very strange meandering way that's how conversations are like you you sometimes just have to go with them and allow them to go instead of trying to box them in or bringing them back to something right like if someone doesn't want to talk about something that's okay there'll be a time and a place for it we don't have to really like kind of stick in on one thing for someone Cheyenne um, says she find multitasking to be particularly difficult in the role as an SSA as we're working with multiple families and multiple visits and meetings in a single day if I don't write important things down, I won't remember. I, 100%, yes. I know I know it's hard. I think, especially in this virtual environment, right? We've started to like put meetings right adjacent to meetings. And sometimes you just need to plan some debrief, some recap, some self-reflection, some catch up, whatever it could be, whatever you want to put on your calendar. I think being, um, being really again intentional about like planning that in your day is can can go a long way two ears one mouth we should listen more great that's a it's a great way to capture that conversation so let me let me move over here i'm gonna do it one last time let's see if i can do it i was gonna say eddie said i've seen families that were quite offended by team members equating their own experiences with the individual or family's experience. You never know how folks will take things sometimes. Yep. Yeah, great, great perspective, Eddie. 
All right, so that again, um, I don't know if I saw it or just dreamed it. The the link to Celeste video is is um, this image as well. So if you have the PDF, um, you should be able to um, find that video if you want to show it to your team. If you want to show it to anything. Uh, while I did say sharing your favorite can be uh, a bit uh, not as impactful, but I did want to share mine. It's, it's kind of that stay out of the weeds. And I alluded to this earlier, right? That you sometimes just have to share a little bit about yourselves. You don't have to give all the details. You don't have to quote the rule and like what number it is in section. But uh, Celeste kind of talks a little bit about it in the stay out of the weeds is that people are just looking for connection. They're just looking for a way to connect themselves with you. They want to know, do you have kids? Because they have kids. They want to know, again, if you're from a certain part of the state, if you've had similar experiences, if you have uh, similar cultural or faith backgrounds, they want to know that and they want to create that connection with you in order to start building that relationship and rapport. And, and you can obviously be very um, specific with what you share with folks, but I think if, if you'll find as you share a little bit more about yourself, it becomes kind of a little easier for them to share about themselves. And I, I, I added this in here as well and, and mentioned it already during the four square, but sometimes just completing a four square by yourselves and sharing it with your team kind of sets the stage that like, hey, I'm coming to get a lot of information from you and I'm willing to share about myself too. And, and kind of trying to meet them a little bit halfway. Uh, all right, so just returning to our overview, uh, we're kind of getting to time here. Hopefully folks can kind of understand that difference between like assessing and being really intentional and in how we plan for assessment and assessing and some of the tools that we have for assessment. The my assessment, the ISP, what I introduced to you today, those are great ways of documenting information, but if we're not really planful and intentional about how we're getting that information and, and when we're getting it, um, we sometimes just wait until that ISP or pre-planning meeting to jam it all in at the end. Uh, hopefully you're able to identify some tools to get different team members to participate in assessing and allows you to uh, get all those different perspectives and then celeste hopefully imparted some wisdom on you that I, I certainly cannot and just some strategies to develop those relationships and rapport through conversation i mean this is kind of social work at its core right it's trying to have those really meaningful and engaged conversations uh, so hopefully that allowed folks uh, the chance to kind of do all of these things and we, we kind of wrap up there. Um, I will share. Oh, I do have an additional evaluation. So I know um, I know Lisa has one for your CEUs or CDPDUs. Um, if you scan that QR code with your phone, if it's handy, or if you just click the link in the chat, um, this is just a quick evaluation. It allows us as we here at Ocali continue to engage with SSAs and county boards uh, across the state, as well as uh, continue to partner with OECB, we can be mindful as to what we can do a little bit better, what was helpful, what wasn't, um, and be able to make this better maybe next time. Awesome. Well, if, if you guys are like me, you should go ahead and just do the evaluation right now. I won't be offended at all. Um, Thank you so much, Alex, for that. I think you gave us some really good ideas to think of. And I love the idea of committing and being intentional about trying some new things. So I put in the chat box, I would love to uh, hear back from any of you who um, end up deciding to try out those new tools. Um, shoot me a, a, an email and, and let me know. Maybe we can uh, use that in some information and a follow-up with Alex sometime in the future. So um, hear how it went for you and you could share your experiences. Go ahead, Alex. And I'll add, we have a, a quarterly newsletter. So uh, I'll add here uh, in the chat, this is like our, our center, the LTC's homepage. A lot of our, the tools that you'll, that I talked about are on there as well as some additional learning opportunities and other things. Um, but at the bottom, there's the stay in the loop um, box. If you type in your email and subscribe, we, we just send it out quarterly when we have new updates, new trainings, um, future events, um, tools to download. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, and great uh, resources on our center website, and we're always developing more for us as well as Employment First. Um, so feel free to subscribe and you'll, you'll stay in the know. That's awesome. All right. 
Well, great. Thanks to everyone. And um, I think this was a great session today and um, very timely with all the work around um, Ohio ISP and assessing and getting to know people and monitoring and as they said, CQR. So thanks for coming today. Thank you. I will go ahead and give a big clap to Alex since you guys can't do that, but um, he is seeing all the great comments. And um, just a reminder, watch for an email from uh, OACB's Member Connect to claim your CPDUs. Um, and also you can check uh, starting tomorrow, there should be, um, or well, give me two days to get the PowerPoint and um, our mentees and then also the recording into um, Member Connect. So we will talk to you all soon. And thanks for being part of the SSA summer series, Alex, and to all the SSAs out there. So, all right. Thank you all. Appreciate you guys coming. Appreciate you on all the work you do. I know it's, it's a really difficult job. Someone mentioned that earlier. So thank you guys. All right.